Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, Sarah. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up our uh, last meeting here in August uh, with Sarah presenting on casual paths and closing back doors. I do have to hop here. Just wanted to uh, say hello to everyone, get started. Uh, we do have Ashley signed up uh, for next Wednesday, and we are meeting despite the holiday on Monday, um, where we're going to be uh, working through finding front doors. But um, glad to see everyone here, and I'll pass it over to Sarah. And uh, uh, if you have any questions or anything for me, feel free to reach out. Uh, otherwise, uh, look forward to seeing the recording later when it's finalized. Take care, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I prepared the chapter eight on causal paths and closing back doors, which was a lot shorter than the last presentation, so that was nice. Um, and I think we're mostly going to be looking at DAGs today and try and figure out how to work with them. I know we did that the past two weeks, like figure out how to actually draw a DAG and then like make it a bit less complicated. Um, and then today we're going to focus on how we can find out how to close back doors. Um, yeah, so first off, I'll talk a bit about paths and DAGs, which should be quite familiar by now then the difference between good and bad paths and front door versus back door paths. Generally, front door paths are good and back door paths are bad. Um, then we want to understand how we can close paths because we don't want the bad paths, basically. And then we'll talk about colliders a bit. And then there's a section that's not really so similar to the rest, it's more about what else you can use your DAG for. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about that in the end. Like an interrupt me anytime when there's something you want to add or something that's not clear. Um, yeah. Okay, so first things first, um, let's talk about paths. What's a path in a DAG? It's basically any path between two variables where you can go on one of these lines. So let's say we want to find a path from A to D. One path would be A, E, D. Another would be A, E, B, C, D. And another one would be A, B, C, D. So just a lot of different paths. And they tell us how two variables are related. They may be related directly, but they also may be direct, uh, related indirectly. Um, and that's just important to have in mind when you want to do causal stuff. Um, yeah. Any questions on this? Cool. And then why are we talking about paths? Because we want to find all of the paths. So let's say we have a DAG like this one. And that's nice for an overview. Um, but now we want to find out all of the different paths that we can find between the treatment and the outcome variable. And uh, the author gives us this cook recipe, basically, uh, of five steps. And so you start at the treatment variable because that's what you want to have an effect on the outcome. Then you follow any of the arrows um, going in or out of the treatment variable. So the easiest one would be going from treatment to outcome here. Um, and then you repeat that step. So going, following the path until you come to the outcome variable. Here, it's a very short path. It's just directly from treatment to outcome, but um, it becomes a bit more complicated when you, for example, decide to go to um, B, then you need to find out, okay, do I wanna go through A to go to outcome or do I wanna go to C to get the outcome? Um, and I thought we just take this as an example and try and find all of the paths. Um, so yeah, feel free to name one of them. Uh, okay, right. So the treatment to outcome, that's a path, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's, I guess, uh, do the backup method. So if we have treatment to outcome, we can back up to treatment. Yeah. Uh, and then we can do treatment A outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was reading this chapter, I was at first confused 
what they meant by PATH, but of course we're going for many possibilities like treatment B, C outcome as well. Mm -hmm. I think the only one that we haven't caught yet is treatment A, B, C outcome. Um, yes, cool. So I, I put in the solution here, but I think we caught all of them. Um, so let's just do another one. So this is about wine and the impact on lifespan. And the author thought of a couple of ways in which wine could be related to lifespan, um, some other variables that are out here. Um, so let's just do the same exercise again. Which, which paths can we find from wine to lifespan? Yeah, the obvious one, wine to life, lifespan. And then mm -hmm. you could do the wine to drugs to, to lifespan as well. Yeah. I guess getting a little bit more complicated, you can do uh, wine to income. Well, I guess none of these are more complicated. They're the most complicated one, I think, is wine to income to unknown one to health to lifespan. Yeah. I think there's also the one from wine to health to you want to income to lifespan. That's a bit messy, yep. but it's also there. And then I think we've still got wine to help to lifespan missing here. So I, I thought that was interesting to think about this because usually I'm just like focusing on the more direct ones, but like these longer ones, they can have implications too. Um, so I think that's just a good thing to have in the back of my mind to consider those paths as well. Um, you know, uh, one thing I was thinking about as I was reading through this is of course, like these, are toy examples, right? They're not particularly complicated, um, but you could end up with a really messy situation, right? Where, you know, maybe that algorithm is is more useful. And I'm assuming some of this DAG software, I haven't looked into it, but probably can identify these paths for you from, right, from, from treatment to, to outcome. I don't know if any, has anyone looked into that? I, I, I haven't, but I'm just assuming that's something that could be um, could be automated for sure. It's true. I haven't tried it out. Like one of the Daggety um, yeah. packages. Yeah. I don't know if you guys seem like it. Something we might want to look up because um, yeah, I think figuring out off the paths is quite quite a task. So it would be nice to have it automated. Yeah, in, in a real world situation, I could see that being being more difficult, of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So these are the solutions we have like what one, two, three, four, five, six different ones. Um and two paths with this U1 uh, variable in the background where we don't really know what it is. Okay. So now that we've figured out how to find paths in DAGs. Um, let's talk about different types of paths. Uh, we have, according to this author, we have good and bad paths. And we have front door versus back door paths. Um, and these are just direct quotes. Um, basically, good paths is, are what we want the treatment effect to be. Um, so anything that we think should count for our research question and bad paths are those paths that shouldn't count. So they're alternative explanations and they take away from how we want to explain uh, the impact of our treatment on our outcome. Um, and that's very similar to how front door and back door paths are um, uh, defined. So um, front door paths are paths where all of the errors face away from treatment. Um, and then the rest would be back door paths where we have one, um, one arrow going in the other direction. Um, and then on top of that, we have direct versus indirect effects, which in some cases it might be okay to have an indirect effect. So if we go back to wine and the effect on lifespan, um, 
we also have this indirect via the drugs. And in some cases, we might be fine with that, but in some cases, we might not be fine with that. Um, and we might not want a mediator going on there. Um, so I think that's another reason why it's good to, to draw a DAG and think about how we could get from one to the other. Um, yeah. Just thinking about these, so this would be a front door path, right? Like going directly from wine to lifespan and wine drugs lifespan would also be a um, front door path. And then here we have one arrow that's going in the wrong direction. So that's a back door path. And that's the same thing for the next couple of paths as well. So these four paths, we don't want them. They're backdoor paths. Um, so they're bad paths. <laughs> So we want to close them and mm -hmm. make them go away. Um, yeah, and that's already the, the um, topic of the next mini chapter um, is how to close paths. Because now that we know there's good paths and bad paths, we want to get rid of the bad paths. And a path is basically open, so we need to still close it, if all of the variables along the path are allowed to vary. Um, which can be, um, or let's do it the other way around. So we can close them, they're not open anymore if we, speak, if we pick a specific data set. So for example, um, drugs would not be allowed to vary if we selected our samples so that we only have people who do not use any drugs. So then drugs could not vary anymore. We don't have any, uh, anybody in our sample um, where who does use drugs. So it doesn't vary anymore. Another way to do this would be just to add a control variable. So to add the variable, does this person use drugs? And that's a later chapter, but just here. And another option would be to do matching, which is also a later chapter. So basically making sure that um, our control and our treatment group look very similar to each other. And so it doesn't vary in a way that makes other explanations possible. So yep. now that we know what closing is, um, which is basically not allowing, allowing a single variable on the path to vary, um, let's go back to this example again. Um, and let's think about which variables we would need to stop the variation on. So we only have the effect of wine on lifespan that we want. So only the front door. Um, which which variable would we need to, to close or to control for to be able to close the back or pass? Yeah, I, I thought it was, um, what, income? Maybe it was one mm -hmm. of them? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the, the other one, other one, health? Yeah. Okay. And then we're already good to go because that the paths need to go through them, right? Because um, one or at least one of them doesn't go through health. So if we close income, we close this path, and we close this path, and we close this crazy diagonal path. Um, and then if we add mm -hmm. health to it, we're fine. So we don't care about the unobservable variable in the background, which that is a really nice feature. When you think about this, that you only have to eliminate one of them in the background, um, and then you don't care about the rest anymore. Yep. And then there's another thing called colliders. Um, and a collider is something that we do need to worry about if we control for stuff, um, because a collider um, is a variable and if it is on a particular path, um, then both arrows point at it. So if we if we look at this solution, for example, U1 would be a collider because, wait, no, the other way around. Do we have one here? Here, no. Actually, we don't have one. <laughs> Sorry about that. Nope, don't have it. Okay. Um, so both arrows point at it. Um, and then if we do have that on our path, then the path is closed anyway, because it's not possible to go through it because both point at it. So no direction to go through. 
Um, but the problem is that if we control for this collider, then the path but opens back up, which that is a huge problem if we think about how traditionally we just throw in all of the variables we can think about, um, but that just makes it a lot easier to, to do causal um, inference and to really find a causal path. Um, and I thought this, this part was a bit unintuitive, like why a path opens up if we control for this collider. Um, yes, and, and he says in the book, the two variables pointing to the collider become related once we control for it. And his um, example in the book was, imagine that you want to have a sandwich for lunch and you have two options. You can either buy it or your boss decides to um, just throw around for the whole office. Um, and if you don't know if your boss is gonna throw a whole round for the whole office and you're very hungry, you're still going to buy your own sandwich because you wanna eat something. But the moment that you control for knowing whether your boss buys a sandwich or not, all of a sudden these become related. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a, a good example in the book as well. And it, it kind of agree with you, like the, the idea is a little, it, it's not not super intuitive uh, when you first uh, look at it here. Yeah. yeah, so that's colliders and we can avoid them by not controlling for them because if we don't control for them, the path is closed anyway, which that's that seems easy. But then the problem is that we always have a sample that's somewhat selected on something. So if we think about psychology, for example, they mostly have psychology students in their, or at least in Germany, in their surveys. So then mm -hmm. you just have a huge collider there potentially if you want to have college attendance in there, for example. Um, yeah, so thinking about what the sample is and how that automatically controls for something would be interesting or would be very important. Um, thinking about that, do you guys know anything about confounders? Because I always hear them together with colliders. Um, yeah, when I think of confounders, I, I, I think of variables that you do want to control for, um, uh, typically in the, the context of uh, a, a regression. So, I mean, we were talking about those backdoor paths, right, where we were controlling for like health and income. I would think those would be confounders in this case. Um, yeah, someone step in if I'm I'm wrong there, but you know those. If if we were doing a regression, I guess we'll we'll find out in a couple of weeks. But but th we'd want to include those as variables. Um, and if if they are, and you know, in that regression, but we're still trying to identify the impact of wine and lifespan. Um, yeah, those those would be considered the uh, the confounding variables. I agree with you all. I, I think about confounders every once in a while, and I like how this book specifically defines colliders as having arrows going inwards to it from both directions. But also, whenever I try to look up just general definitions of confounders and colliders, it's actually pretty sparse out there. Yeah, I agree. I was here then and everybody's always like, yeah, yeah, you have to take account of them um, or you have to take them into account. But then like, yeah, definitions are sparse. So I guess then co confounders would be those variables that we control for to close the back doors, right? Okay. That's that. Yeah, that's how, how I have, have thought of them. Yeah, it's really helpful. Okay. I know um, just on the topic of, of colliders, uh, right? Like the the problem of course is like, have you defined your DAG correctly? And I guess there could be a chance where you, you don't, right? And so you've you've misidentified stuff and then you might might actually control for that collider that you don't want to. And then I think your results then are no longer valid, right? So I guess that's just another reason why you wanna be careful when you're designing these these DAGs. Yeah. Do you actually use them in your work? I have not. Um, I have I have used matching before, and certainly you know re regression um, 
where you're trying to, you know, figure out the causal impact of a, of a variable. But, but yeah, I, I, <laughs> I will say in industry, I, I guess we're, we're a little lazier sometimes. <laughs> I, I would love to use these uh, going forward, but um, yeah, I, I haven't in practice. Yeah, same here. I feel like they're super intuitive when you see them and they're already drawn yeah. out. But when you try doing it yourself, thinking about it and which direction they are should go, it becomes very complicated very quickly. Yeah, um, there's a faculty member at, in my department who um, is like a big proponent of using DAGs and all of that stuff. So I... Um, I hadn't really heard of them before, not like the technical term, like obviously I'd seen one, but I didn't know like the term directed asynchronous graph um, until like listening to him talk and his interactions with like my lab mates and stuff. So this book came about at a very like opportune time because I was like, I have no idea what this is, <laughs> um, but it seems very like useful. Um, Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, there's a, a body of literature that doesn't use this that's still talking about causal effects, right? So, um, yeah, it just, it, it, it's one approach. And I think this is like the Judea Pearl approach, right? He's very, emphasizes DAGs, but I think there's there's other, other stuff out there that where you don't talk about that at all. I've been um, kind of slowly reading through... Um, one of these books, uh, Mastering Metrics. I don't know if you've heard of that one. I think that one and Mostly Harmless Econometrics, they're basically by the same authors and, you know, it's it's causal inference, but like DAGs aren't even discussed in those books, as far as I know, at least not Mastering Metrics. And I'm like halfway through it. Yeah, it seems to be a newer thing. I feel like yeah. I was in an econometrics class once and they were like, yeah, about 20 years ago, they mostly thought about it like as control variables and now it's slowly creeping in. Yep. Okay. So um, talking about the usefulness of DAGs, um, there's another way in which we can use our DAGs and that's like trying to figure out if we have everything that's important in there. So obviously a DAG is always a model and it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be full um, and that's fine. But like sometimes we may have missed out on something significant and that just screws up our whole model there. Um, so one way to do this is um, to list all of the paths and then only consider the open ones. Um, and then try to close them and see if, if this path is close between A and B, if there's still a correlation there. And that's called a placebo test in this context. So we would expect from our model that there's no correlation there whatsoever. But if there is, then we need to consider it. Um, so if it's small but non-zero, it should be fine in most cases, um, but if it's enormous and a really strong relationship, then you should probably think about what's causing this. So if you missed like a variable that's on the path um, or, I mean, that's mostly what it could be, right? Like it doesn't really make sense in any other way, but um, yeah, that's one way to think about your model and use the DAG to, to make sure that your model makes sense. Yeah, I thought that was a cool like diagnostic tool, right? For your for your DAG. I'm wondering if um in one of these later chapters they'll actually show you how they're doing that. It doesn't say anything on placebo here. But would be nice. I think in the book it said to just use any of the diagnostics used in um chapter four. So basically a correlation test um, yeah. or a simple um, regression. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I've heard placebo tests and honestly in econ, they're just mostly put in together with robustness checks and anything that you do after your main regression is done. So I just thought this was really helpful to like get a clean definition of why it's called a placebo. Um, and why you would 
needed. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is all the chapter already. Um, there's some homework there. So if you want to, we could check that out together. Not hearing a no, so I'm just opening <laughs> it. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, let's just go for the first one. Assuming that a path has no colliders on it, what's the difference between a path being open and closed? I think this one comes back to like, how do you close a path? Um, so basically a path that is closed would have a variable that's controlled for in some sort of way, or we have a matching going on in the background. Okay, so we have a new causal diagram right here. And we wanna go from x that's here to y which is here and i think listing everything is just a bit too long but maybe we can think together about um what what um front door paths we have and what back door paths we have yeah i mean uh, the, uh, front door of course x to a to y mm -hmm. would be the the big one and I think that's actually the only one, right? Because if we look yeah, here, X, B, Y, yeah, that's a backdoor uh, mm -hmm. given the, and then that this B is points to X and Y. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, so we only so have we one. Wouldn't wanna con we wouldn't want to control for C. Yeah, no, right. no. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess the only thing that we would have to control for to close the vector pass would be B, right? Because C is already closed up and then everything else goes through D. Do you know what's up with this E arrow going to A? Will we have to do anything about that? I don't know if we would, right? Because we're only concerned about uh, X to Y here. And he is kind of independent there. Yeah, so and as it, long as it doesn't point to X, we should be fine. Yeah, that's that's what I would think. Yeah, because it's like any variable you take, there's probably always going to be something else that causes it other than the treatment. Yeah. And then uh, similarly, I don't think we, we'd care about F at all. Mm-hmm. Because our outcome impacts F, but again, we're concerned about our treatment X on outcome Y. Yeah. So that's um, somewhat irrelevant here. And I'm wondering, you know, in a real life situation, would you even need to include that relationship at all? Is that even really relevant um, to what you're you're studying? I, I, I'm not sure it would be. No, there is include it. The only thing I could think of is like if, like I guess it could be useful to have if you wanted to illustrate like the significance of your findings, mm -hmm. like you like oh well this relationship between X and Y is significant because Y influences F and F is hard to measure, whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or the other way yeah. around maybe right if Y is like a latent variable that's really hard to like measure mm -hmm. I don't know something like xenophobia or so, and then F is the number of crimes against people from an out group. Um, so like Y is really what we're interested in, but we have to proxy it or something like that. But then again, we wouldn't really be interested in the relationship between X and Y, probably between X and F. Okay. Check. 
where we are supposed to draw our own dag. I think that's a bit long. Um, okay, let's maybe consider this teaching quality popularity number of publications dag. Um, what type of variable is popularity in one path? It looks like a collider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so suddenly, if we would control for popularity, teaching and number of publications would correlate. Yep. Although I think it's... I'm not quite sure if there should be, if there shouldn't be a, an arrow between them or an arrow behind yeah. the page. Yeah, sir. it certainly seems like those two would be related to me. Yeah, just because you need kind of like, you're going to maximize them on some sort of scale to become a tenured professor, for example, right? So we would yeah, maybe not try to maximize the quality, but like maximize it on a point where it's good enough or something like that. Yeah. Okay. We have another super complicated one. So we want to look at whether pandemic related lockdown causes recession. So we have the lockdown here and the recession there. So let's look at front or pass again. Yeah, it looks like we have at least a couple here, right? Lockdown mm -hmm. to recession. And then we have the indirect lockdown unemployment recession. And that's those are the only two that I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah. And then we have a couple of pesky backdoor paths through stimulus and prior economy. Yep. Okay. What would happen if we controlled for unemployment? I mean we'd essentially we'd be back down to just the lockdown to recession the like direct effect um and we'd also control for all of our other confounding variables right almost right because we still have prior economy yeah. that has a direct effect so we'd still have to control for that right you're right yeah but it closes down a lot of paths. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think the rest is not as interesting if you don't have a paper and a pen altogether um, <laughs> to draw up a new deck. Um, yeah, that's all I have prepared. I don't know if you guys want to talk about something or if we just want to cut it short. What do you do you guys think? No, I, I think this is good. It, it was a shorter chapter and you did a, a great job uh, presenting it, Sarah. So thank you. Yeah. Yes. Then I'll just hit stop in the chat.